Welcome to Ingemar Baptist Church. I'm Katie Clark, and we are so glad to have you join us in worship. Here are a few things happening on the Hill. There will be a brief meeting today for all Wednesday night volunteers to meet in the Youth Sanctuary at 5 p.m. and all Sunday Nursery and Children's Church volunteers at 5.30 p.m. We will not have an evening service tonight on campus. Instead, we will meet at Ingemar Attendance Center for a time of devotion and prayer walk for the upcoming school year. Don't forget, Back to School Bash is this Wednesday, July 31st at 5 p.m. Roving retirees will go to Jim and Nick's Barbecue in Memphis on August 6th. Please see Wayne and Glenda Alexander for more details. There will be a church financial seminar on August 12th from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Hillcrest Baptist Church. A meal will be provided. All members of finance, personnel committees, and deacons are encouraged to attend. Please contact church office by July 31st to RSVP. IBC will begin taking family photos for an updated church directory starting on Saturday, August 10th in the Old Nursery. There are two different sign-up sheets on the welcome desk in the South Foyer, one for singles and couples and another for families of three or more. Be sure to pick up a registration form, which will be next to the sign-up sheets, fill it out, and bring it with you to your session. Time is limited, so be sure to sign up soon. Please see Hayden or Kim Edwards with any questions. Finally, if you are visiting with us, please take a second to scan the QR code or fill out a guest card and stop by the welcome desk on your way out to pick up a free gift. That's what's happening on the Hill. Thanks for being here to worship with us. Good morning. What a joy it is to see all of you. I know where everybody's trying to squeeze out the last few drops of summer. I'm with you. So, uh, <laughs> hey, real quick before I forget, at the end of this service, I'm supposed to announce it at the end, but I'll just go ahead and do it now. Tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to meet at the John Whedon Auditorium, Mr. Whedon, at the, uh, at the, uh, at the school at 6 o'clock. So that we'll do our prayer walk as we pray for our school and teachers and students as they prepare to go back. I know, ugh, school's about to start back. But anyway, uh, I hope you enjoy the last few little drops of your summer. Hey, listen, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm excited to see what God has in store for us. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. So pray with me. Father, we come to you this morning. We just thank you so much, God, for this chance to gather today. Father, we thank you for uh, just the ability to be able to do this freely without persecution. Father, I pray that as we go through this service, Father, I pray that you would do a mighty thing, that you would move, that you would, Father, bring a conviction, that you would bring joy to our lives, that we might worship you, Father God, with just joyful spirits. Father, I pray this morning that you would simply be with us, and I ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. We find redemption through one thing blood of Jesus Christ. That blood was shed for you and for me and for all who will claim him on a hill called Calvary. Let's stand together. <laughs>
get the opportunity to have the mic and mess with him. But somebody's birthday's tomorrow, and he's going to be 30, and he's getting old. Um, so just wanted to mess with him, but hopefully, prayerfully, you're going to have a healthy baby boy on his birthday. You're, re you're ready to sing. Am I ready to sing? Yeah. Sure. I guess if you want to. I don't think they want to hear me sing. <laughs> Start it with you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. opportunity to come into your house, to come in, to praise you, to worship you. Dolor, I just ask that you please be Brother Rob and guide him here in just a moment as he's about to proclaim your word. Give him the words that we all need to hear, myself included, so we can grow more like you each and every single day. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Lord, you are kind in all your deeds. How precious is your loving kindness. And you, O oh God, I put my trust. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you.
Amen. You have your copy of God's Word open with me to the book of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 24. Matthew 24. I'm just going to warn you, this is a 10 point sermon with three extras added on the end. So if we start right now, we might get out three or four minutes late, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just messing. It is really a 10 point sermon. So we're going to jump right into it. Matthew chapter 24. If you notice the last part, we didn't plan this. Phil and I didn't plan this. The music, he does his music, I do my preaching. But uh, the last part of that song says, Lord, haste the day that our, the faith will be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning is the events leading up to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I know if you have uh, had your ears open any length of time over the last uh, however many weeks and months, it seems that in Christian circles there's a lot of talk, gossip, whatever you want to call it, about the return of the Lord. People say the day is drawing near. We're living in the last days. I believe we're living in the last of those last days. And for whatever reason, choir, I don't know why, but for whatever reason, it seems that oftentimes it's, it's kind of a taboo thing to preach about. Buddy, I don't know why. It's biblical. It's in the Scriptures. It's a truth. Jesus Christ is going to return. But for whatever reason, we have two camps that have emerged. You have on one side uh, eschatophobia which means you're afraid to talk about eschatology. Eschatology, by the way, being the study of the last things. You have eschatophobia. And on the other side, another camp is eschatomania. That means that that's all you talk about. You're a maniac when it comes to eschatology. I don't think either position is healthy. I think we need to be balanced. But I think that sometimes we can lean more towards the eschatophobia side when it comes to preaching the word. So this morning, what I want to do, what I felt led to do, is I want to address some things, John, about the return of the Lord. You should be, not just you, John, but everybody, in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. We're going to begin in verse 3. This is the Olivet Discourse, the beginning of the Olivet Discourse. This is at the end of Jesus' ministry here soon after he's going to be crucified, buried in a tomb, and then resurrected on the third day. But here he is. He's on the Mount of Olives, and we have an account of the famous Olivet Discourse. Okay, Matthew 24. Let's get going if we want to finish today. All right. Verse 3. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, that's Jesus, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not, the yet, that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Watch this, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Here we have a discourse. We have a series of events, I believe, that is going to take place leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. So let me give you a little context of what's going on here. Jesus, he's on the Mount of Olives. They've just left the temple area there. In verse 1, you'll see he comes out of the temple and he goes to the Mount of Olives. Anybody been to Israel before? Anybody know where the Mount of Olives is? It's, 
It's, it's like right there just outside of the city. There's a valley. You can see the Temple Mount. There's a valley. And then there's the Mount of Olives, okay? And so Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, and they're looking at the temple. And in verse 2, Jesus uh, tells them, he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Uh, uh, that, well, first of all, go back to verse 1. Jesus came out of the, from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Look how beautiful the temple is. Look how beautiful this building is. Verse 2, sitting on the Mount of Olives there, he sees this and he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So they're coming out of the temple. Jesus prophesies in 70 AD when Rome sacks the city. Guess what? The, ever, the whole temple was destroyed. It was pulled apart. Uh, and that prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. But they're coming out. They go th- across the, through the valley. They come up to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples come to him and they say, Yo, Jesus, what's going to be the sign of your return? And in response to those disciples, he gives them a list of things, signs, events, descriptors of the world, of the signs, descriptions of what is going to happen leading up to his return. Does that make sense? Furthermore, let me say this, that he relates these signs to birth pains, to labor pains. Okay, we know about that very well, hopefully here, right? Uh, uh, Birth pains, right? You've, you've, some of you ladies, you've had children. You understand contractions. That they start off kind of weak, far apart. And as labor grows closer, you get closer to the delivery. What happens to the contractions? They get stronger. They become more intense. They get closer together, right? Leading up to the birth of the child. And Jesus, Rick, is saying that here, these are the signs that are going to take place. And they're going to be like labor pains on a woman, meaning that they'll start off not as intense, and as we draw closer to the last days, they'll be more intense, more fervent, and they'll be closer together. Does that make sense? Raise your hand if you understand where we're at, okay? So the disciples have come to him, and then he starts off with this, and I want to say this, I want to, before we go any further into the 10 points, okay, I got 30 minutes to do it. He gives them a warning. And I want to pause right here and I want every one of us to have a warning concerning eschatology. Watch this, verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Listen to me. There is so much junk going around about our faith. And that's what it is junk but more specifically let me say this there is so much junk going around concerning the last days okay look you you seen on facebook the thing about the 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 solar eclipse making a hebrew i i don't know i've taken hebrew and i don't think i saw that letter that they said it was gonna it doesn't look like that anyway there's you know you see things like that you see people getting on tv and they say uh Uh, This is the day I had a vision, and this is the day of the rapture, and the Lord's coming back this day. Let me tell you, Jesus specifically said in the Word of God, no man know the day or the hour. So there is a bunch of junk out there concerning eschatology, okay? So I'm not saying be eschatophobic, okay? But I'm also saying don't believe everything that you see on Facebook, okay? Okay? Look at what Jesus says. I think if he were to write this today, don't believe everything you see in Facebook. Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. So church, don't be misled. Where do we get our information from? Right here, the Holy Scripture, the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. Amen? Ten things, ten signs leading up to the return of Christ. And they will grow stronger, stronger, and closer together as we draw near to his day. Let me say this right quick. Is anybody looking forward to the day of the Lord, the Perusia? I am. Praise God. I am looking forward to the day that my faith will be sight and the clouds are going to roll back as a scroll. Ten signs, ten signs leading up to his return. Number one, many, for those taking notes, many will come claiming to be Christ. 
Many will come claiming to be Christ. Look at verse 5. Jesus said, For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. Did you know that in 2017, New Zealand Herald reported that in 2017, there were seven men on the globe that claimed to be Jesus Christ and had a significant following in 2017. Many people have come through the ages claiming to be Jesus Christ. We've had him here in America. There's a guy over in Asia that people are following that they think he is Jesus Christ. All through the ages, we have seen people claiming to be the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I think we've seen that in history. I think it's happened through history, and I believe it's happening right now. Let's put a check by that one. I won't dwell too long on that one. Number two, the second sign, the second sign that I want to point out is that there will be global conflict. Global conflict. This is a favorite one of everybody to say. Wars and rumors of wars, right? Watch. You will be hearing of, verse 6, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened for those must, things must take place, but that is not yet the end. I'll come back to that in a second. Go to verse 7. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Jesus says that as we draw closer to the last days, there will be nation against nation and wars and rumors of wars. John, you're a military guy. Did you know that of the 10 deadliest wars in human history, nine of those have been in the last 200 years? Did you know that? Did you know what, you know what the deadliest war in all of human history was? World War II. World War II was the most deadly war that this globe has ever seen. However, turn the news on. I'm not trying to be political. I'm just trying to point something out to you. Take the blinders off for a second. Turn the news on. Have you not seen that instability on this globe is at an all-time high? Do you not see that, that instability and rumors of wars and nations rising against nation continues to grow? As I'm preaching, did you know that there are currently 92 countries on this globe that are engaged in a foreign conflict? 92 countries. I know we talk about China and Russia, the United States, Israel, and Ukraine. But there are 92 countries on this globe right now, as I preach, that are engaged in a foreign conflict. It's kind of shocking. And Jesus promises, he says that as we draw closer to that day, this global instability, this, uh, glo these global conflicts will only grow stronger and closer together. So we should be not shocked when Russia invades Ukraine. We shouldn't be shocked when Iran attacks Israel. Why? Because Jesus says that is what is going to happen leading up to his Return. Number three, one more thing I want to point out before I take a break and show you something else. And that is natural, number three, so if you're writing notes, okay, a third sign is that there will be an increase in natural disasters and epidemics. There will be an increase in natural disasters and epidemics. Watch this, verse seven, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Watch this, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. In various places on the globe, Jesus is saying that there will be natural disasters and there will be epidemics and they will increase. What is the hot button topic in the news today? It starts with a G and ends with a oval. <laughs> Global warming, right? Global warming, right? The sea levels are rising, hurricanes are intensifying, and all these things are happening. Listen, I'm not, I don't know if global warming exists or not. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about scientifically, okay? I'm here to tell you that the truth is, is that in the last hundred years, excuse me, excuse me, since the night in 1970s, let me say it this way. In the 1970s, uh, this is reported by Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN. In the 1970s, there were a hundred on average natural disasters on the globe per year. Okay, today there's an average of 400 per year. 
Okay, the UN chief says disasters have quadrupled. The World Meteorological Organization says that there were seven counts. There were 711 disasters from 1970 to 79, and then there were 3,536 recorded disasters from 2000 to 2009. Look, I don't know if it's caused by global warming. I'll tell you what it's caused by. It's caused by the sovereign God of the universe saying that it's going to happen. Whether he uses global warming or not as a mechanism to do that, that's besides the point because Jesus Christ is on the throne. He's sovereign. He said it would happen. And guys, take the blinders off. It's happening. Anybody seen the hurricane prediction for the year? It's twice as much as an, an average year. Oh, Brother Rob, you're just paranoid. No, I'm biblical. Look. <laughs> what, about, uh, what about famines? What about famines? Natural disasters and epidemics. Did you know that there are 258 million people on this globe experiencing food crisis, uh, uh, food um, uh, 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 hunger uh, at, a, at a crisis level. There are 258 million people experiencing food insecurity at a crisis level. That is reported by Time magazine to be a 100% increase in the last five years. Guys, I was a vegetable farmer for four years, okay? Uh, we have state-of-the-art modern agricultural practices. We have chemicals and tractors and all kinds of that we have not seen since from the history of the world except for this last century, last century and a half. But yet we face a hunger problem, a crisis like the world has never seen. It's interesting. Why? Because Jesus said those things would happen leading up to his return. Now, here's what you're saying. Well, Brother Rob, hadn't there always been natural disasters? Yes, there has. Brother Rob, hadn't there always been famines? My family's Irish and the, had the Irish potato famine and all that stuff. And, and yeah, there was a COVID virus, but, but what about the flu, the whatever Spanish flu epidemic in the 19... You know, some of you are saying... Those things, you say, ha, Brother Rob, we tricked you. Well, what did Jesus say? Watch this. Watch this. Look at verse 6. For you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Hadn't there always been wars and rumors of wars? Crusades and all that stuff. Watch what Jesus says. See that you're not frightened, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Hmm. Look at verse 8. <laughs> But all these things, meaning everything, is merely what? The beginning of the birth pangs. So let me just say here that, yes, these things are increasing in intensity and they're happening just the way the Bible has happened. But just because they've happened since the beginning of time does not mean they're not a sign of the return of Christ. Why? Because Jesus specifically says these, the end is not yet when you see these things. It is merely the beginning of the birth pains. While, yes, like labor, they'll grow in intensity, they'll grow closer together like we're seeing, but then and of, those and of themselves are not an indicator of the end of time. I got 10. We've done three. Now let's keep going, okay? Those people stop right there and say, that's a wrap. No, <laughs> we're going to keep going. Watch. Number four, the fourth sign, the return of Christ, is that persecution will increase. Write that down. Persecution will increase. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. You will be hated. Does that say you could be hated? Does that say you No, it says you will be hated by all nations. A sign of Jesus Christ's return is the escalation of persecution and the hatred of Christianity. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they were trying to show. Maybe it was a Greek god. Maybe they really were mocking the Lord's Supper. Did anybody see the Olympic opening ceremonies just a day or two ago? Did you see that they, it looked like they were mocking it to me. 
They were mocking the Lord's Supper. It was the LGBTQ community. And they had a bunch of drag queens. And listen, those people need Jesus, okay? So we need to pray for them, not cast stones. We need to pray that they would repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. But they dressed up and they mocked the Lord's Supper. Wow. At the Olympics, the whole globe is watching. And Jesus says, then they will hate you. (laughs) They will persecute you. They will put you to death for my name's sake. Guys, open your eyes. You know, here's the thing, though. Pseudo-Christianity has never been persecuted throughout history. What do you mean by pseudo-Christianity? That means fake Christianity. Okay? It's never been persecuted. Think about this in Roman times. Okay? You could be a Christian, sure, but you just had to worship Jesus like you worshiped the emperor and the rest of the Roman gods in the pantheon. And as long as you did that, (laughs) yeah, sure, you, you could be a Christian. But the moment you stood on God's truth, the moment you said, no, Jesus is Lord, God's word is God's word, that's the moment you began to be persecuted. So in today's time, are there churches who don't experience persecution? Yes. Are we blessed here at Ingemar Baptist Church to live in the Bible Belt in the South, right? In this little bubble that we find ourselves living in? Yes, because we don't experience persecution. But that is not a reality for the rest of the globe. Oh, sure. You can be a Christian in China as long as it's, as long as it's a state-run Christianity. Oh, sure. You can be accepted on the global stage as long as you welcome homosexuality in, in, in a Uh, whatever, abortion and all the other big hot button topics. Sure, you can be a Christian, but the moment you stand on God's truth is the moment persecution comes. And it's been that way throughout human history. You say, Brother Rob, well, hasn't Christians always been persecuted? Yes, they have, but it is on the rise. Did you know that Open Doors reported that 300 And 65 million people, that's more than the entire population of the United States, 365 million Christians face high levels of persecution for their faith. That is one in seven Christians on this globe today, right now, face severe persecution. Did you know that in 2023, attacks on churches and Christian properties reached an all-time high since recorded history? The news doesn't report on those things, but it's the truth. It's happening all around. I won't name names. In fact, you have some persecuted Christians who are living right here in New Albany that have had to flee because of their faith. It happens. And the truth is, is that as Christ returns and we draw closer to that day, persecution will increase. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Listen to me, church. The days of cultural Christianity and your faith costing you nothing are over. They are coming to an end. It will cost you something to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So prepare yourself. Take the blinders off and see the world that we find ourselves living in because Christ indeed is coming. Number five, the fifth sign. Whew, I got to hurry. I look at that clock every time and I spent too long on that one. The fifth sign is there will be an apostasy. An apostasy. You know what an apostasy is? It's a falling away. Verse 10. He's giving us these signs. He's got this sequence of events, right, that's taking place. Verse 10. At that time, as persecution increases, at that time, many will fall away. Many will fall away. Guys, look around you. Look at the big name Christians, quote unquote Christians that have departed from the faith, that have renounced their faith, 
They have deconstructed their faith. Now, some of you are saying, well, Brother Rob, you can't lose your salvation. You're exactly right. You cannot lose your salvation. Once you are bought by the blood, nothing will remove you from God's hand. The, the, the fact is, though, is that our churches have unregenerate church membership. That means that you can join the church, you can walk an aisle, you can raise your hand, everybody can vote on you, not know who you are, and you can be a member of a church, and because of that, you can give the appearance, you can look the part, act the part, and you can pretend to be a Christian. And Jesus says that as persecution increases, those people who are unregenerate church members, who simply by lip service profess Jesus Christ, not a heart change, they will be pointed out, and they'll depart the part of the faith. Why? Because Christian, Christianity, your faith is going to cost you something. And Jesus says that as we draw closer to that day, there will be a great departure. Guys, you're seeing it. Look at the Western society. Let's not pretend. We have had a record number of baptisms at Ingemar Baptist Church, and I praise God for that. But we're an anomaly. Look at Western society. The Southern Baptist Convention is in a free fall. When it comes to baptisms, the evangelical world in Western society is falling. People are departing the faith. The average age of churches is like 65 plus. I love you old people, but, but the truth is, is that if we don't start reaching young people, churches will die and close and we're seeing it happen all across our nation and Western society in Europe. Why? Because we're seeing a great falling away. We're shocked. <gasps> the truth is, we shouldn't be shocked. Why? Because Jesus said it would happen. And it's happening. Then verse number six. <laughs> the sixth sign is there will be internal betrayal and hatred. Internal, meaning internal to the church. Look at this. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Wow. How many churches do you think in the last 100 years in the state of Mississippi? I don't know the statistic. I should have looked this up. How many churches do you think in the last 100 years exist today out of conflict from another church meaning they're like huh we can't get our way we're going to go to another church and they go start their own church <laughs> now listen i am all for church planting you understand me i think it is the healthiest thing a church can do is to send people to go and plant a church in a healthy way we ought to be a people that are multiplying churches we ought to fill this nation with new churches if we planted a thousand churches in this nation, it wouldn't be enough. We hadn't run out of lost people, I'll tell you that. But how many churches do you think are planted, not planted, started out of division and conflict? The truth is, as a pastor, I deal with it every day. Conflict and people are mad and upset and hatred towards one another. You say, Brother Rob, you shouldn't say that from the pulpit. It's the truth. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with all this. <laughs> Jesus says, that'll be a sign. That as Jesus draws near, <laughs> there will be internal conflict within the churches. Look, he's talking about the churches Verse 10, at that time, many will fall away. Fall away from what? Their faith. So he's speaking about the church and will betray one another and hate one another. Look around you guys. Look at the churches that are just here in our community, steeped in conflict and division. Hatred. It's happening. Number seven. Number seven. The seventh sign is there will be an increase in false prophets slash teachings. So if you're taking notes, write it down. False prophets 
slash teachings. Look at verse 11. Many false prophets will arise and will what? Mislead many. At that time, as we draw closer to the end, many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Guys, look at the garbage that is being expounded from our pulpits. Look at the garbage. Look at the mainline denominations that have fallen. You know, I grew up a Methodist, you know, and then we were a little different doctrinally, I guess. I didn't know at the time because I wasn't a very good Methodist. <laughs> but you know, the truth was we had an acolyte. You know, we'd light the candle and all that stuff. We'd wear a robe, maybe. We were a little more liturgical, formal. <laughs> but there really wasn't that much difference between a Methodist and a Baptist. I didn't know the difference that much. But look at the difference today. Look at today. I'm not hating on the Methodist church. I pray they, they repent. We have a whole denomination that has accepted something clearly is sinful and it's being taught and expounded in pulpits. Look at the prosperity gospel. Look at people like Joe Olstein, Kenneth Copeland, that are preaching garbage. And hundreds of thousands of people are following them. Let's go to the other side of the aisle. Look at the crazy legalism that is taught in some of our churches. Have you not read the book of Galatians? Go read it. It'll change your mind on legalism. Well, you yeah. preacher doesn't wear a suit and a tie. He can't preach. Where do you read that in the scriptures? Jesus wore a tunic and sandals. It's the truth. People follow it. <laughs> it's a false teaching because scripture is absolutely contrary to that. Some of you say, I don't like that, Brother Rob. Well, read the Bible. <laughs> look, guys. Look around us at the teaching that is being expounded. And then when we preach the Word of God, this is what the Word says. <laughs> we brussel our feathers up. <laughs> Who does he think he is? No one. I'm a nobody. I'm a beggar telling another beggar where to find bread, as the famous dude said. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they shall heap to themselves teachers in accordance with their own lusts. Look around us, guys. Look around us. We are seeing it happen. False teachings and false prophets are on the rise and it is very popular to follow after them. Jesus said, be not deceived. Whew. Number eight. <laughs> Another sign of the times is there will be an increase in lawlessness. An increase in lawlessness. Look at verse 12. Because lawlessness is what? Increased. Because lawlessness is increased. We'll finish that verse with number nine, okay? Look, guys, if you, do I have to even say, look on the news. We're burning cities down. People are protesting all over the world. I, I was watching, I love to watch this guy on YouTube, Drew Binsky. Anybody ever watch him before? He has traveled to all... Uh, every country on the globe, okay? And he like reports on it. He's been North Korea and Yemen and, and some of these crazy places on the globe. But it's crazy to watch some of the things that he's seeing on a global scale to look from his perspective, just going to, as a tourist, the unrest, the lawlessness that is across our globe. We're sheltered in America. We have laws. Yeah, we see the lawlessness increasing in America. But on the globe, and who went on the Brazil mission trip? They definitely don't abide by traffic laws, do they? <laughs> no, right? Look on the globe. Look at the lawlessness that is on our globe. 
And it's there like we've never seen. Let's keep going. Number eight is increased lawlessness. Number nine is decreased love. Decreased love. Watch this, verse 12. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will what? Grow cold. It'll grow cold. Look at how loveless our society is. We have a whole generation of people that think the word love is a cuss word. That's not manly. No, it's biblical. It's what you should be doing is loving. You know, it's funny. My brother, Adam, has got, gotten all somehow all the, the old VH, not VH, what are those little things? The little home video tapes from the camcorders from the 90s. You know what I'm talking about? And he's gotten all the home videos and he is converting those uh, to DVDs. And so, uh, I don't know, a week or so ago, we were over at Adam's house, and we just were sort of watching some of those old home videos. And there was one video of where we were at the zoo. We were at the zoo in Memphis, okay? And this is a time before cell phones and social media and all that stuff. And I just want to say, we were there with the family. I just, it just seemed, I wasn't, th- I mean, it's a video, right? So you have to, you know, you don't hear it all. But, but it just seemed that that was just a happier time. People loved each other. In fact, in that video, uh, in that video my aunt has some Billy Bob teeth, you know what I'm saying? And was uh, playing jokes on people. And, and, uh, <laughs> and she had the Billy Bob teeth in walking around the zoo. And people were laughing, and, you know, and, and we're all joking and laughing. Uh, and people just seemed to love one another. I was a kid, and I think I was throwing rocks at a duck or something in the pond, and, and uh, it's on video, and the zookeeper comes up and reprimands me. As, you know, I reprimand, you got to get away from there, son. But it, but it was a very nice reprimand, you know, like, she was like, now, you know, she was like, now, the ducks, they can peck you really hard, you know what I'm saying? And she was saying that, you know, in today's time, no, they would be calling security, right? It just seems... But as you look back on those times, people loved one another. That even in society, we got along, yeah, we had our problems. But it wasn't like it is today. With a hatred for one another. An anger, a maliciousness. Everybody out for themselves. Jesus says that as we draw closer to that day, there will be a decrease in love. And we have seen that. Now, one more. (laughs) One more. And I want to stop right here. And you're saying, Brother Rob, now all those things, you can make a case, they've all happened since the beginning of time. I mean, Nero was persecuting people. And I get it, okay? I understand. But I want you to see the last one, number 10. And I want to take a moment and I want to dwell on this one. Number 10, if you're taking notes, the 10th and last sign of Christ's return, everybody listen to me, if you don't listen to anything else, listen to this one, is that the gospel will be preached to all nations. The gospel will be preached to all nations. Watch this, verse 14. He says this, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world, as a testimony to all the nations, and what? And then the what? Will come. And then the end will come. So yeah, there's always going to be wars and rumors of wars, and yeah, they're going to grow in intensity and famines and earthquakes and all those things. But the last thing Jesus said would happen is that the gospel will be preached in the whole world to all the nations, and then the end will come. What is the great commission in Matthew 28? Say it with me. Go therefore into all the world and make disciples of what? All nations. That's the fulfillment of the great commission. Now, does that mean that everybody's going to come to Christ? No. Does Jesus say that everybody's going to come to Christ and then he will come? No. He says, but the gospel will go to all nations. Ladies and gentlemen, At no point in the history of the world are we as close as we are to bringing the gospel to every nation on this earth. Every physical nation, every physical nation, every 
nation, national, has received the gospel. But I think Jesus, the word is ethnos in the Greek. That's where we get our word ethnic from. It means people groups. So you realize there are different people groups within nations, okay? Like the Native Americans, right? There are different tribes and different people groups. So have we reached every people group on this globe? I don't know, but we're pretty close. You say, Brother Rob, how do you know that? Well, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention. This is just my belief. I was at the Southern Baptist Convention uh, two years ago to Southern Baptist at New, in New Orleans. And the International Mission Board got up, Paul Chitwood. By the way, the International Mission Board is the largest missions organization on the face of the globe in the history of the world, okay? The International Mission Board got up to give their report, and the president, Paul Chitwood, un unveiled a new program that they were starting, and it's called Project 3000. Project 3000. They're looking for 3,000 people. If you feel led to do this, let me know. I'll try to get you hooked up, Okay. They are looking for 3,000 people to be explorers, is what they're calling them, to go and find unknown people groups. What that tells me is that the IMB has learned there are people groups they don't even know that, that exist. Like, they don't even know if any more people groups exist. They've got to send people into the jungle with a machete to go and look for unknown people groups that no one has ever come in contact with. What does that say? It says that they're running out of unknown people groups. That's what it says. In fact, to quote their website, it will take a lot of research, but the IMB is committed to finding and engaging people so far off the map that not much is known about them and their exposure to the gospel. Wow. Wow, we have to find people living in some unknown place. You ever seen Google Earth, right? Like you can, you can look at any place on the globe with Google Earth. It means that we're running out of people who have never, people groups, not every person, but people groups who have never heard or had a chance to hear the gospel. Wow. Wow. What about the invention and the, the, the advent of the internet? I mean, you can be in the jungle of Cambodia. You can be in the jungle of Cambodia today, and you can get on YouTube or Facebook Live, and you can watch this sermon being preached. Think about that. You could be at any place on this globe. You could probably be on the moon and live stream <laughs> this service today. Think about that. And look at what Jesus says, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Listen to me. I'm not a, trying to be a death, doom, and gloom, and the short sleeve guy with a tie <laughs> on, at 3 a.m. on YouTube telling you that Jesus gave me a revelation of the rapture. I'm not trying to be that guy, okay? But I am telling you, you would have to be blind and completely and totally biblically illiterate to not see the direction that this world is going in. That these things are happening just as the Bible said they would happen. I don't have enough faith, guys, to believe we're not at the last part of the last days. I don't know when he's coming back. But I do know that he's closer today than he was yesterday. And I, I know the Lord could tarry, but I don't see him tarrying much longer considering the things that must take place. I'm a few minutes over, but bear with me. I want to tell you what we should do. Well, well that's great news, Brother Rob. What do, we, what do we do with that? <laughs> what do we do with that, Brother Rob? Well, here's what we do with it. Number one, I think we endure. I think as a church, we endure. As a Christian, we endure. Things are going to get tough. You heard it here first, okay? Things are going to get tough as a Christian. What do we do? We endure. Look at verse 13. But the one who what? Endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures. 
Keep the faith. Stand firm in the faith. Stand on biblical truths. Practice spiritual disciplines and remain steadfast as Christ draws near. Number one, we endure. Number two, what do we do? We unify. We unify. What do you mean by that, Brother Rob? Clearly, the Scriptures teach that there is going to be disunity and confusion and chaos on this globe as we draw closer. Churches are going to split apart. People are going to be upset. Those worldly churches, let them be worldly. Here at Ingemar Baptist Church, we need to unify. As the world falls apart and crumbles, we need to be a people who are unified under one name. Yeah, we can disagree on some tertiary issues, but we must unify under one name, and his name is Jesus Christ. So we should unify. The world may crumble around us, but not us. Why? Because we are unified under one name, and we're indwelled by one spirit. We should be a people who are unified. And then what do we do? <laughs> do we circle the wagons, Jeff? Oh, man. Circle the wagons. Do we dig a bunker in the backyard? Do we, we put some food down there, some MREs? <laughs> we stock up on bullets? I mean, I don't know. No. You know what we do? We advance. We advance. The kingdom of God must advance. There is one name under heaven which men might be saved, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we are tasked with bringing that name to the ends of the earth. That is our purpose as a church. Not to sit around and pat ourselves on the back, but it's to advance the kingdom of God. We have one mission, and it is the Great Commission. And we are to preach this truth of this gospel across this globe, no matter the consequences. So what do we do? Circle the wagons and dig a bunker in the backyard? No, we advance. And we be a light to an ever-growing, darker world. Why? So that Christ might be glorified and man might be saved. The truth is, is that there is unrest, there's uneasiness, all in our world, economic unrest, church unrest, uh, national unrest, I don't know, people are just uneasy. Raise your hand if you have that uneasy feeling, you just kind of feel uneasy about the direction of the world. I, I think we all do at times. The truth is, is that we're uneasy. And the day, today, there's some that might be saying, I'm ready to cast the towel in and quit. No, you endure. You endure. You stand on the Word of God. You stand on the truth. And you remain steadfast. It's real easy for us to fall into the temptation of disunity, casting stones and upset over this and upset over that. No, you unify under one name. Be unified. Reconcile yourselves one to another. Stay unified. Be unified. And the truth is there are some who have circled the wagons. I'm going to stay right here in Ingemar. And I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to build a gate. No. No. The mission hasn't ended. You get up and you advance. In the Marine Corps, right? You would buddy rush. Take the hill, man. Take the heel, get up, and you advance the gospel in the kingdom of God. What are we to do? We're to endure, we're to unify, and we're to advance. So church, listen to me. This time of invitation, it's for you. I don't know what this world has in store for us. I don't know what's to come next. But I would ask you today, make a commitment that you're going to endure. You're going to unify, and you're going to advance the kingdom of God. Stand with me. Father God, we come to you this morning. Father, what excitement it is. What exciting times we find ourselves living in. Lord, to be here in these last days, advancing the gospel being unified under one name and enduring as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today as 
We see the world in the state that it is around us. Father God, help us to be a people who are steadfast, standing on you and the truth of your word. Help us to not be deceived. Let us simply, Father, be a people who love you and love one another so that you might be glorified. Father, I pray this morning that you simply have your way with us. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here to worship with us online. If you'd like to make a decision today, call the number that's on your screen. We have counselors that are standing by that would love to help. If you're calling after our live services, leave us a message and some contact information and we'll get back with you. Thanks once again for being here to worship with us. I hope to see you soon in person and God bless.